Everybody, I'm so excited to introduce Will Corrigan, assistant coach at WNL, to the Virtual Lacrosse Summit. Will is a great friend. We uh, coached together back, I think, after his sophomore year in college. He moved out to Colorado and coached with me for a summer with the 3D Colorado 2016s. And we had a great group of kids, and we got to be uh, pretty good buddies. We took a lot, a lot of trips and talked a lot of lacrosse, and we've kept in touch ever since. I'm good friends with his dad. Um, and now he's making a name for himself in the lacrosse coaching world. Will, Will, welcome to the show, and thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. Excited. Definitely some of my, my fondest coaching memory. That's where I, I knew I wanted to be a coach, was, was coaching with you. Um, <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I just remember how good of a defensive coach you were back then. Coaching yeah, the the defense, I was taking notes. I wanted to, to do it again, but I've, I've never really gotten the opportunity. Um, you know, a little bit here and there, but, but definitely I enjoyed it because it was – you know, a little bit outside of the, the comfort zone. You know, you were, you were dialed in on the offense. So I was working with guys like Ben Kingdom. Um, Charlie? Remember, Charlie Leonard, man. Charlie Leonard. What a stud. I still yep. keep in touch with that kid, man. He's the best. He's a beauty. There's no question, man. He's an overachiever, just like yeah. his old man. Just, just outworks people. It's awesome. He does. He does. Awesome. So uh, making wing play cool again. <laughs> um, and yeah, let's do it, man. I'm really fired up. Um, so uh, get started whenever you're ready. Yeah, man. So, um, you know, just going through this, you know, a little outline of, of what we'll talk about. I'm sure we'll, we'll go completely off the rails at, at some point. Um, but, you know, really just talking about coaching the, the face-off position and, and, you know, learning about it from my perspective and then what we did the past two years with the wings, right? So, so I, I know – I think Jamie may have said it before, but I wasn't, you know, I took face-offs in high school out of kind of necessity. I kind of did it for a year at Notre Dame, um, but never really did a lot of it. I always went for my feet, you know, was, was a neutral grip type guy, right? Not um, at all what you see anymore, right? You see that as a counter or, or kind of a change up when guys need to, to mix it up, they're losing or they, you know, see that as an advantage, but that's really all I did. So it wasn't, you know, so I didn't have the, the knowledge of, of you know, the, the intricacies and the, the technique that goes into it. And when I got to WNL two years ago, that was something I was tasked with. And, and I was coming from Seattle, um, being a head coach out there at a high school, at Woodenville High School, um, you know, and I really loved the fact that I had something that was mine, right? Going from being kind of in charge to, to a second assistant was what I needed as a coach, but it also was, was tough in terms of having autonomy over stuff. And that was what I had autonomy of. So I, I, you know, dove headfirst into it. Um, you know, I, I, you know, we can skip to, to kind of my background here. You know, what I would say, the, the face-off position, I, I had to find a way to, to learn about it. Now, luckily, I, I inherited a guy who was coming off being the, the rookie of the year in the ODAC conference, was first team all ODAC, was, was fantastic um, already as a face-off guy. So it's not like I, I had to start from scratch. Um, and, and really, you know, it was, you know, going to the face-off academy stuff, learning from those guys. Brendan Fowler, I got to know, and, and, you know, all the face-off academy guys, they were great to me. I went up to their national showcase, and they let me just kind of, you know, hang out next to them and ask them questions and, and you know, was recruiting a little bit, but mainly it was up there for myself to, to learn about the position and, and help our guys and figure out different ways. So from the face-off position, that's, you know, where I got most of my knowledge, watching YouTube videos of, of Grenlian and, and different stuff, um, you know, just to kind of ingratiate myself in that position. Um, you know, I mean, doing this, I want to thank, you know, my dad, obviously, you know, is the reason I coach. Um, coach McCabe was great, giving me the autonomy and really trusted me with it. Once he saw the work I put in, he kind of let me, you know, run situations in practice for it. You know, I had my own kind of section of practice to do it. And we'll, we'll get into that later. And then the, the, the guys that really made a difference and made this the, the wing play and what we called wing school um, this year was Jack Hodgson, who was our face-off guy. He's, he was an honorable mention All-American for the second year in a row this year. Um, and Jed Laundry, who's now been a, a two-time all-conference uh, short stick specialist and really as mainly just a wing guy. This year he had like 75 ground balls, mainly off the wing, a little bit as a D-midi, had I think – close to he had I think 10 or 11 points uh, on the year all from the wing um, you know and and you know he really helped create this position and educate me on what he did and and what 
you know, how we could work on different things to, to make this something, you know, make it cool and make it something that could help us win games ultimately, right? Because that's, that's what we needed to do. Um, you know, his story is, is unique because he and Jack faced off against each other in high school. Jack went to St. Chris in Virginia. Jed was the face-off guy at Collegiate. They faced off, you know, you know, countless times through high school. Both came here. Jack ended up being better, and Jed was the, the backup, and we didn't like kind of wasting his athleticism and talent as a, as a backup face-off guy. So we started using him on the wing, you know, and he became a good D-midi. He was great picking up ground balls um, and, and has been a fantastic. They're both going to be seniors this year. Um, you know, excited to see what they can do and continue kind of the wing school, um, you know, mentality. Um, you know, as I said, you know, for, for coaching face-offs, um, you know, my coaching philosophy in general is, is – you know, kind of gaining trust of guys, right? And especially in this position, it's, it's a position that guys take great pride in, right? The face-off academies do a great job. They take a lot of pride in what they do. Um, and I don't want to come in and, and step on people's toes, right? I didn't face off, you know, I, I only know what I know, right? So, so a lot of it was asking them questions, you know, and then using the knowledge that I'd learned from all the, the ways that I was learning to, to work with these guys and find little ways to make them 1% better. Right. So we, you know, this presentation isn't going to be a ton about the, the face off position, you know, the technique of all that, because, you know, there's guys who are much uh, better than me at that. So so we'll talk a little bit about it because obviously it's, you know, a huge part of the game and, and part of this, um, you know, but but a lot of it is, um, you know, going to be about the wing play, what we did in games, how we we used our time wisely during practice to get, you know, that kind of middle group of guys. Right. A lot of times face-off guys get work during, um, you know, they do some, some full field stuff. You do some scrimmage situation, but a lot of it's during like man up, man down, right? It's like man up does their thing with a scout man down, man down does their thing with a scout man up. And there's a, a couple guys that are tweeners that don't really have much to do or are just standing there and not going to be in on either one of those. And, and we use those guys as wing guys. Um, and, and, you know, our face-off guys, we got a lot of really good work and it became, you know, a, a really productive part of practice and no one kind of got wasted in that time. A lot of this, right. Going through this, having to level with guys, um, you know, and, and we worked on kind of non-negotiables that, you know, we developed as a group, right. I mean, we kind of had our own little face-off unit and, and we developed non-negotiables and then, you know, there's obviously just like there are in, in any aspect of the game. And then, you know, there's, there's situations and, and, you know, kind of, alterations to, to any one of uh, any situation that you discuss, right. Where it's decision-making or, or stuff like that. And, and we kind of went from there, you know, so we did, you know, daily drills for our face-off guys, right. Some, some simple stuff. Everybody has their own way. I, even this weekend I was out recruiting and saw face-off guys doing just kind of um, drills I'd never seen was, was intrigued by, right. For us, it was, you know, ball hops right on the first whistle, you're, you're hopping over the ball as quick as you can. On the second whistle, we clamp, right, just to get used to kind of getting back set and, and exploding through the ball. Um, then we'd go kind of four to five, just kind of quick down set, go, stay in your stance, just kind of get those hands moving, you know, get used to being on the whistle. That was something that they told me, like, hey, I, I really just want to hear the whistle a bunch early so that I can, um, you know, start to, to get ready for that. Then we do kind of you know, full exits, right, going forward, defensive, um, you know, and we added different ones in there, all just with the face-off guys. Um, and then, you know, there's a whole rotating cast of, of drills that uh, are a rotating group of, of drills that we would do along with that as like the first five minutes of, say, we had a five to, to 15 or 10 to 15 minute session with the, the face-off and wing play guys. Um, you know, the face-off, and I say face-off, but this is, you know, all three guys, right? The, the wing, you know, the, the two wing guys and the face-offs. The biggest thing we talked about was, was no fast breaks, right? Um, and, and the first year, I don't know if we gave up a face-off uh, a face -off goal maybe all year. I can only think of maybe one my first year. This past year, we struggled with it a little bit. I think we got a little too cavalier at times, um, trying to make our own plays and forgot to, you know, protect the hole or, or be defensive at times. Um, but you know, that was something that, that, you know, cost us at times, but, but it definitely was a, a huge issue for us. We didn't want, we didn't want to give guys opportunities to beat us from the face-off facts. Um, no jumps, 
right? You know, the whole point of the face-off, right, is you're trying to win possession. You don't want to, you know, kind of never even have a chance at it, right? So we work a lot on not timing the whistle, right? Sometimes guys, you know, they're just trying to time the whistle and they'll jump occasionally. We work a lot with different drills on, on not doing that, right? And, and one, the face-off academy guys taught me a couple. A couple are just, you know, you hold the whistle for, for five to 10 seconds, right? So you're down, it's down, set, you just wait, right? And you make guys kind of wait on you and, and you know, make sure that, that they're not doing that. Another one is to have them do it with their eyes closed, right? They can open their eyes when the, um, uh, you know, when the whistle blows, but they're, they're down, set, all of it with their eyes closed, and they're kind of just waiting on that whistle, right? They're not thinking of anything else that kind of takes away any sort of distraction or them trying to time it. They're just waiting to hear the whistle, and then they can explode through the ball. Um, and then the other part was, was we added a little punishment, right? We, I think it was, it was 10 push-ups for every jump. Didn't matter what drill we were doing. Didn't matter what we, you know, if we were in a, um, you know, the warm-up or if we were in a, a you know, in a full field scrimmage. It was like right away. If a guy jumped, he dropped and gave 10 push-ups right away. I think eventually that got too easy. We started adding running to it. It was touch the far sideline. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. You know, get guys and, – and, and it takes away their rep, right? Guys want, want to get their reps. And, and when a guy has to get up and run to the far sideline, someone else hops in, you know, that's something they don't want to do. Um, you know, and same thing for first-chance GBs. Again, the face-off is all about gaining possession, right, in any way you can. Um, and and missing, missing ground balls, you know, being the first one there, you work so hard to do all that, you can't miss, miss ground balls, you know, waste those opportunities. So there was a push-up punishment for that as well. This was my kind of spreadsheet that I used for, for drills right over here. There's, there's face-off drills. Um, you know, there's some ground ball drills, right? Our goals for the year, right? Um, you know, when we would meet, some, some notes on that, right? Um, you know, wing play drills. And we'll go through some of these in, in more detail. Um, but, you know, kind of uh, everything that I could think of with facing off, whether I learned it from guys, whether it's something I kind of made up on the fly, you know, and the, the wing play stuff is stuff I came up with more and more as we started creating this, this wing school, um, you know, idea, right? So we had more drills with, with wings involved, getting guys involved. We set goals for the wings, right? No fast breaks, forcing turnovers, getting ride backs, even if we lose the ground ball or we lose the clamp, right? Um, and then some terminology we had, um, like, to be honest, I don't think we really used any of that. We talked, we would just talk pre, pre face off about how we were going to be um, in the face off. Um, cool. So wing school, wing right? school. What, we're, what we're, what we're supposed to be talking about. Um, you know, we, we, like I said, we created this during kind of that man up, man down. We, we brought midfielders. Um, you know, we had Jed was, was fantastic in, in creating it. Um, you know, we brought a freshman kid who was a D midi this year. who wasn't on either one of the man downs, you know, a kid who, who will, you know, probably be on the wings in the future as a D midi. We brought an offensive midi who was, on the second midfield line, but he was so athletic that we've just wanted to find ways to use him. Um, and he wasn't playing great offense to start the year. And we were like, we got to find ways to, to use his talent. So we put him on the wing. We made him work a lot on defense. And he ended up being a guy who had, you know, 30 ground balls, 15 to 20 points, and, and took, you know, every other wing on the faceoff. You know, I mean, it was, it was really cool. It helped him kind of gain some confidence and, you know, have some – you know, pride in being a part of this. And then it transferred to everywhere else in his game. Um, you know, and I think the biggest thing that I could tell other coaches, right, is that doing this, it created a culture on our team of guys who wanted to be a part of this. It was something that they weren't on man up or man down, right? Everyone wants to be on man up if you're, if you're an offensive guy. Everyone wants to be a part of, you know, man down if you're, uh, you know, a defensive guy, right? And if you're not part of those, then you, in that time period, you do it in practice. A lot of times it gets lost, right? Or you get lost. There's just not a lot to do. So this became something that guys, guys were trying to leave their, their man up, man down and, and come up to us and, and work on, you know, different things, um, you know, to, you know, be a part of this, right? And it was, it was awesome. It was a great, you know, help with our culture and, and just kept guys uh, engaged in practice. So you all of a sudden had guys on the uh, scout team man down that were like, you know, I, I'd really rather be going to wing school. Yeah, we did. We had, we had guys who, you know, if, if there was two short sticks down on, on man down for scout team, you know, they were coming out. One of them was like, Hey man, you take the reps down there. I'm going to go up and, and be a part of the, the wing school stuff, man. We, we had fun with it, you know, and, and it, it, 
to, to make it a little more enticing. We always had a goal up there at the midfield. So a lot of our drills ended in a shot because that's what they wanted. Man, everyone wants to shoot the ball, especially the middies. Um, so we, you know, it was, it was a cool thing. We had guys coming up there, you know, guys kind of floating around and, and we really, we got the whole middle of the field and it was, um, you know, really, really cool. So the, the first thing that I think that I haven't seen people talk about before um, that we worked on with the wing school and, and what, you know, Jed brought to the table was communication from the wing. Right. And I think there's, there's guys, you know, the, there's hand signals, right. Guys will hold, you know, the top of their stick if they, if they want him to be forward or he's going to go forward or, you know, lean on the back of his stick if he's going to go back, right? There's little things I've seen before that guys do. Well, we took that a, a whole step further. And first, you know, Jack and Jed or, or whoever our face-off guy was, and the, and the face-off guy was in charge, right? We gave him autonomy to talk to the wings before they went out, right? Kind of had a little huddle, almost like, you know, like a doubles team does before every serve, right? Before every face-off, those guys got together on the sidelines, depending on the situation. I'd be talking to them because I was running the box and they talked about where they want to go, right? Where, where do we want to line up? You know, what's the scout on the face-off guy that we've seen on film and, and, you know, how are we going to play this face-off, right? So it started there. And then as we got out there, as, as, you know, our face-off guy, Jack is going down, we've got Jed and the, the LSM on the far side, right? We'd, we'd line up, you know, typically kind of uh, wherever, Jack told him Jed would typically be at, right at the midfield line and our LSM would basically be at the midfield line too. Again, it helps when you have a guy who wins clamps. Um, but Jed is then communicating where the open space is to him. So he's dialed in. He's looking at the ball. He's getting ready for a faceoff. Jed's telling him, hey, you're open back, right? You're open forward. If Jed's moving around, hey, I'm locked up. This guy, you know, he would move up and down the wing, right? And, and there would be, if that guy's sticking with him, it doesn't matter where he lines up. He's going to be right on his hip. He's saying, I'm locked, and he'd line up in a certain spot, and, and he would then, um, you know, get, tell him where his space was. Hey, you know, open forward yourself, right? You know, different communications. And, and there was no exact science on how we communicated, um, you know, but it was just telling him where the open space was and what he could do with the ball, right? Um, you know, and then post-whistle, it was on, especially on tie-ups, right? Guys get, get kind of locked in. Jed is running in and the wing is running in and they're telling him constantly where he can exit with the ball, right? Or where the open space is. And, and the big part was using the direction of whatever way the face-off guy is facing. So as they're spinning, right? Or they're, you know, doing what they, they're grinding away at the face-off backs. He's constantly telling them, hey, you're open left, you're open back. As he, you know, keeps spinning, now he's open to his right. Hey, you're open right, you're open. Hey, send it deep to me, right? That was, there's, there's a clip we'll watch here in a sec where we're, that was something we worked on was, was Jed telling him, hey, send it deep because he would be on the guy's, the other wing's back, right? And he'd be able to kind of chunk him and then go break on the ball, right? So, you know, the communication was something that really helped us. It helped our face-off guys. And it's something we had to drill constantly um, because you got to be willing to, you know, or, or able to grind away at the face-off and have your ears open and listening for that, right? The other part that we realized we had to do this was – the rule this year, they really focused on if a faceoff guy picks his head up, they're going to call withholding right away, right? They, they told us that, and we got called for it a couple times. So if he can win the clamp and keep his head down and just listen to where the ball is going to go, right, or where he should pull the ball, it gives him that extra, you know, second, half second to be over the ball and, and pull it to the right spot. Because too many times you see guys win a, a faceoff or win a clamp and then pull it right into the opposing wing, right, or pull it right into a scrum, and then they've got to do fight all over again in a ground ball scrum that, that just doesn't, you know, make sense or, or makes it really hard and you may end up losing possession. Right. So, very cool. right. So, so one, one thing we would do, right. Is Jed is on, on the opposite side, right. Because we saw in film that, that they were going to try to protect the break. We knew we were going to win clamps, right. Or, or we kind of, you know, had an idea judging by what we had seen on film. So we put him and we'd put him a little farther back and he's now communicating that he's open. Right now, later in this game, this guy starts to go with him because we had pulled it here and he then tells him, hey, you can go forward. Right. So on this one, you know, Jack's able to, to win the clamp. Right. He gets it. He backs again. If he has his head up looking at this, this may be withholding. But because his head's down, right, he, he's able to, to drop step for two steps and then pull it. And we've got an easy face off win. Right. And we get to attack, you know, first chance ground balls. Yeah. Right. So, so this one here, 
right? We're against Denison early in the year, another game that we felt we were going to win clamps, right? We were right now, we call slims, which is two short sticks, right? We know if we're winning clamps, we'll put two guys on. This is a guy who was a two-way guy. Hudson Hamill was, was great for us. He actually was a, a third team All-American, played a little bit of defense, right? We were big on playing guys two ways, but was a first line midfielder and great off the ground, right? So we've got three short sticks here, all right? And, and as we win this, right? Jed, he drop steps, you know, Jed's telling him there's space back here. Right, he tells him he can, he can win it back, right? Win it back and deep because he's got this space, right? And now he's able to run through this ball, right? Make a move and then we get transition, right? Jack, you know, is, is up ahead of the play knowing that we're gonna win that. And, and we go down and, and get a good shot off, right? Another one, you know, to the, the Jack, Jed is communicating right here. Now we're locked, right? Now he's forward. You wouldn't expect, you know, many times you see wing guys be up in front of the face off in case you're going to lose. But we knew Jed was going to, Jack was going to win the clamp and we wanted to give him space, right? So we, this guy's locking him. We put him up ahead. We have uh, Drew Barnard, our LSM is just going to keep him away from the play. And then Jack has all this space to pull the ball to himself. All right, so here he's, he's continuing to communicate. Now he's saying, hey, you know, you can go forward, forward to yourself, right? And he gets this space. And now we're, we're out and, and Jed again realizes it because we've worked on this, knows that we're gonna come up with that and we get transition here. He misses that shot which is why I cut that short. Um, you know, so, so that's kind of some of the, the pre-whistle stuff that, that we, we talk about, right? And some of the drills, right? So let's now go to, right? So, so we're here, all right? First of all, when we're working on this, um, a lot of times the, there's, you know, on most fields there's a soccer circle or a women's lacrosse circle. So we actually use that for most of the time, just so we don't have guys sprinting, you know, 10 yards, you know, unnecessarily, and we can make sure that we're getting, getting quality work. All right. So the way we would line up, right. You know, we would line up a guy here, right. You know, a guy here and we act like this is a wing line and they can move up and down this, right. We've got a face off guy. And then we would have three guys here. All right. And we just face off from here and we move guys around and make sure that, that this is, um, you know, First, we'd, we'd just go live face-offs, right? And we'd work on our communication. And then to help with the, you know, the constant spinning and, and constant communication, we would start these guys from a 50-50, right? So they would be here and we'd start them here. So they're already, you know, in a battle and no one's going to come away with it right away. So now they start to spin and these guys have to, you know, move with them, right? They start to spin. They're, they're you know, protecting the break. Um, you know, doing what they have to do and, and then communicating as these guys are rotating right in the face-off X and telling them where they can exit to, right? So, so that was, you know, the, the full version of it, right? The, the one thing we would do, I know most face-off coaches are probably aware of kind of the corkscrew drill, right? Where, you know, one whistle, you start to clamp and you're circling with it, right? You're kind of throwing your left hand, spinning all the way around, um, what we would do with that is that we would just, you know, partner up again to use guys in practice and to work on something that was going to help us win games. We, we would partner a wing with a faceoff guy. So they're communicating on that. And then on the second whistle, when a faceoff guy is typically going to just pull the ball to himself, now he's pulling it to whoever that voice is telling him to, right? He's communicating, communicating where he is, communicating where open space is, and then he's sending the ball in, in that direction, right? Um, another drill, we would add a second wing guy. Right, and, and this is a drill we call tic-tac-toe. And, and this one actually, you know, we worked on it a lot. It was, you know, he would, this is when we would incorporate the goal a lot of times. We'd face off, right, spin for a little while, pull it to one guy, you know, as they balance the field, he would throw it upfield to another guy and he'd run down and shoot, right? Just make it fun for them, you know, make sure they're communicating. Again, way to use guys in, in practice, right? So they're, they're getting reps of, of different, um, you know, they're getting reps and, and they're getting better instead of just kind of hanging out. I love this, man. The tight, it's like, it's like, it's like, um, you know, tight one-on-ones, <laughs> you know, it's like tight, tight anything, you know, you're just getting more reps. 
and you're focused on the end as opposed to starting everything at the beginning. You know, you don't need to start out, you know, it's like takes forever to get everyone lined up on the wings way out there. So exactly, exactly. And there's sometimes, you know, and you, you do do that, but you do that when you're practicing kind of full field game scenarios, right? You know, that's when you use the real wings and there's, you know, you're going to get reps of that too. But if you can make it harder on the faceoff guys, one, because the wings are already closer, they've got to be more precise on, on where to be and where to pull the ball. And two, the wing guys are already involved in every faceoff. To be honest, I think it'd be a great way to, to make the faceoff more interesting, right? If we're going to talk about, um, you know, how to change the faceoff for the better, you know, if anyone who's watching has ever met my dad, I'm sure he's mentioned that he hates the faceoff. I don't hate the faceoff. I do think it needs, you know, some sort of change to, you know, make it a little more, you know, whether even or, or just interesting, right? Because it's such a crucial part of the game. Um, or, but, and, and, you know, it's not as much fun when a team, you know, is, is, you know, wins 80%. The irony is that um, w when you used to be able to cheat, it was closer to 50, 50, no matter what. That's now it's so clean that, you know, the best guy just dominates. It's true. It's a good point. It does. I mean, and, and it's incredible what some of the guys are able to do. Right. But when guys are, are, the end of the day, if you're going to win clamps, you're going to win the majority of faceoffs, right? We did all this work all, all year. And then we went against York, whose face-off guy I think was a second team or, or a third team All-American, mm -hmm. and won 12 of 30 face-offs. Now, there will be some clips in here we'll watch because, to be honest, those 12 of the 30, we probably won, you know, five clamps of all of those, right? So the, all this extra work we did helped. It just didn't even get us to 50%, right, which is so crucial, you know, in, in a, you know, a, a tournament game, um, right? So here's that tic-tac-toe drill we were, I was talking about. This is against Roanoke. We're, we're slims right now, right? We've got um, Garrett Cannon, who I was telling you, the kind of um, second-line midfielder, d midi wing guy on, on the non-draw side, Jed on the draw side. Um, you know, we'll, we'll watch from here. Right? So here, one, we don't do a great job of, of balancing the field, right? Garrett's in a good spot. You know, this guy's protecting the break. But the way that we kind of taught this to, to short sticks was because Jed was so good at reading the ball, was a former faceoff guy, he knew where the ball was going to end up a lot of times before faceoff guys did. We let him kind of have some, some liberty at the faceoff X. This guy was usually supposed to mirror him so that we're, we're balanced on the field and we're making sure we're not giving up fast breaks, right? So right here, he's communicating. He knows he's open, right? So if we go back here communicating that he's open, hey, open forward, because they've spun a full 180 degrees. Now he's saying open forward. Jack knows, throws it here. Jed's aware of the fact that this, he's Jed, uh, Garrett's going to get the ball, and we, we get a fast break because, you know, we've, we've worked on this. A big goal for us, to be honest, we go down 3-0 to start this game, right, and, and you know, kind of took the wind out of ourselves. We, we were rolling at this point, and, and this was a big momentum changer for us. Right. So a drill that we kind of created, um, you know, just out of needing to use guys ends up being something that, that turns into a really, you know, important, um, you know, part of the game for us. Um, oh, question here. How do you know or feel comfortable that you're going to win the clamp off of film? A lot of times it's, it's studying. Um, you know, that's that's a great question. A lot of times it's looking at the percentage of the guy we're going against, right? So, so looking at what he's done against common opponents. Um, it is really hard to tell if you're going to definitely win clamps, which is why the first face-off of every game, right, we'll, we'll line up pretty defensive, right? We'll put, um, you know, if we go to the, the whiteboard, we're, we'll line guys up. Typically, if, if we are the X's, right, if the X's are the generals, and, and this is the short stick, We'll line him up about here, right, and tell him his first couple steps, right? His first couple steps are going this way, and then he can come in and do his thing. And then from there, we typically have an idea. Um, you know, in conference, we knew the guys. We, we played almost the same schedule this past year we did the year prior, so we knew a lot of the guys we were going against. We knew if we were going to, you know, have a really easy day at, at winning clamps or, or if we were going to battle or if we were kind of expecting, you know, not sure what to expect, which is what it, what, what it was with York, right? I mean, York – we played them the first game of the year and went 50% at the faceoff X. You know, to be honest, we, you know, misdiagnosed the, the film on that one. We thought we were going to be really, 
good. He had looked slow, the guy we were playing in the, the previous games against Salisbury. The Salisbury guy was a first-team All-American, so that probably should have been a, a clue for us. Um, so we kind of went into it thinking we'd win more clamps than we would. But the other part is seeing his technique and knowing what to do even when we're not going to win clamps, right? So, right, the, the, the shovel is something I learned from um, – uh, Brendan Fowler and the Faceoff Academy guys, right? And, and it typically is getting underneath, you know, the the guy who wins the clamp stick, right? And you go, you can't hook his his forearm anymore, right? That's illegal. But you can go, if I clamp down here, I lift my left hand to kind of try to check mark and bring the ball out. I slide in this way and can just at least get the ball moving so that he can't, you know, the guy who wins the clamp can't pull the ball to where he wants to, right? So here is a a good shovel what so yeah, the shovel shovel. Is, what are you ripping his, his shaft you're ripping right underneath the ball right so you'll see here this one will may be tough because they film from far away this is against york and like i said this is how we won most of our our face-offs was was a counter um you know so i'll go slow through this right we line up again we're, we're losing so we're still here we we never were afraid of him like really going forward with the ball and and beating us there um, so, so that wasn't, you know, if we were, we would line him up farther. We would line him a little farther back and we would say, all right, Jack, your job is to, you know, not let him go forward. Um, but you see here, so it's hard to see, right. And Jack goes to it quickly because he, he can feel he's losing it, but see how his left hand is up in the air right now. Not, yeah. not a really high, but it's just enough. And then when you go forward in slow motion, see Jack, concedes the clamp right but if he does this quick enough it's still going to get the ball moving so now his stick is underneath his hands are you guys able to see this jamie yeah so it's kind of like raking underneath his his clamp yep right underneath his clamp right and now at least the ball is is out right and now it's a scrum it gives our, our wings time to get in right and like i said you know jack i, I believe jack told me he came up and he was able to, to kind of just swat at the ball and get it going and then jed is is able to read this and and again make a play come down and another really big goal for us right we're down 3-1 in our tournament game at york and and jed comes down and, and makes a big play for us again right so the counter is is really really um important for us that's that's what the counter is if you're yeah. you're gonna lose plants right you go through that and then you're still able to communicate and your wing guys are are you know hustling in to, to make that, um, you know, it, uh, be a part of the scrum. And a lot of the, the drills you're doing, um, you know, should make them have a leg up on, on the wing and, and, you know, getting ground balls off the wing. Um, right? Wing school. Wing school. So another drill we did um, was, you know, face-off guys, they'll call them hand wars or whatever, right? It's just down set. Instead of pulling the ball, it's just to work on timing. And, and you know, so, so they'll be down and you'll get, you know, you can get five reps real quick of just clamping, right? You know, down set and see who kind of is quicker, right? You're getting on the whistle. What we would do to add to that was we would put one guy on the wing, right? And then, you know, instead of being done after just the initial clamp, whoever won the clamp, the other guy would concede and just kind of let him do it, but the wing would communicate where the ball was, where he was, right? And we'd move him all around, all right? So let's go back to the, the whiteboard. So two guys are in here, you know, and again, if you have four face-off guys, you do one here, you do one over there, and this guy is allowed to be anywhere because it, we don't need him running around, but we want to move him. So maybe he's here, right? We're acting like, you know, he came in and he's here now. Now he's here. And on the, the whistle, right? Let's say the check wins it, you know, he's on whoever wins team. So he's just communicating where he is, right? And, and part of this too is he has to recognize who wins it and communicate, right? So the check mark wins, he's saying, hey, I'm open forward, I'm open forward. If the X wins, he's saying, hey, I'm open back, I'm open back, right? And that guy then fundamentally clamps it, gets to his feet and pulls it to him however he can. Um, so he's you know, on again, teams. What's that? He's on, whoever, he's on whosoever team wins it? Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then part of that is, is, you know, the evolution of that is you add in, you know, a check mark, right. And then these guys are, are moving around together, you know, they can start anywhere. And then, you know, the winner is trying to pull it to his teammate. Right. So, so basically do a face off with just wings here. Right. And they're wherever they want to be and they're communicating as soon as the guy wins it, 
you know, say check mark wins it, the check mark saying, hey, I'm, I'm open, you know, you're open back, right? So pull it here. I can chunk my guy uh, and, and get going, right? He can kind of chunk him and then break on the ball if this guy pulls the ball this way, right? You know, if the X wins it, he's saying, you know, pull it back. Or maybe they're back here, right? They've moved over here. So the check mark is saying, hey, you know, you can either win it to yourself or, you know, for the purpose of this drill, we want to win it to the wing. So, you know, say they're, you know, check marks here and the X is here. You know, he's saying, hey, win it, win it to your right. Hey, win it out this way. Even though it's easier to pull it this way. That's why maybe he does that, um, you know, backwards pivot that we showed in one of the clips and then yeah. can pull his legs this way, right, as he spins and he's got the, the check marks got the edge, right? So, you know, a lot of different ways to, to work on this communication. Um, and, and you just kind of have to be creative. It's about establishing kind of the lingo you want to use and the way you want to do it. And then just find ways to, to get guys involved. Uh, so here, right, Medusa, if you've heard, this is a drill I got from, um, you know, one of the, the um, IMLCA convention face-off academy or face-off presentations and what it is. So like the corkscrew drill, right? So you start with a corkscrew, blow the whistle. He starts rotating, um, you know, staying low, right? We work on keeping our left hand low so that guys can't shovel us if we win it, right? And this, these guys are kind of constantly circling. They're kind of moving all about, making it hard for him to, to find space to exit, right? Um, then we, we would add a wing guy. First, we would do this just for him to find space, right? Win it on the second whistle. He's got to pick his head up quickly and exit to, to wherever he can, right? So right now, maybe it's that way, right? The next progression we did was this guy would move with them, right? Or, all, or find space and he would be communicating and telling him where the space is, right? So either staying next to a guy and saying, hey, you can send it to me or say these guys both decided to, you know, kind of, gang up on this side and you know these guys moved here saying hey you can go back with it or whichever direction he's facing at the moment right go yourself right go forward yourself you know back whatever it is so uh, again just kind of making it tough on guys one two three four now we're using five guys in practice right who, who may not have had something to do right you know you can use anybody for these and then your your wing guys are getting reps what um would the check guys in a drill like this ever be like, well, right here, to your right, to your right, and then just, like, they pop it out to the other team? <laughs> they, because they, you know that that's going to start happening, you know. It's true. It's true. The, the, the secret may be out now. Guys are going to start, start community. You know, hopefully you recognize the right guy's voice. Um, what, what they did to, to, you know, poke fun at me half the time, because it's called a Medusa drill, they would call themselves the snakes, and they would hiss at him the entire time. <laughs> At a, at, a, at a ridiculousness to it that, that was a, a hostile atmosphere. They would just hiss at him while moving around and, and you know, make it fun. Um, Very funny. Well, it's like, it's like, it's like um, telling, uh, you know, coming up and being like, well, slip, slip, switch, switch, exactly. switch. Exactly. You want, you want to slip, you need us to switch, to switch, you know? You guys did that so much at Denver. Denver still does it. Oh, I know. Your dad is not impressed with that. You know? Oh, he hates it so much. He hates it. And it's annoying if you're an offensive guy. It's so frustrating. But it is, uh, it's very, very effective. All right. The next thing we want that you obviously have to be good at is ground balls. Right. Um, you know, I think, you know, the communication, right, on a, on a ground ball when you've got three guys, the anticipation to be able to know where the ball is going and break on it quickly. And then just, you know, being able to put your nose down and run through and absorb a check is, are, are kind of three really key parts to being able to, to be effective personally as a ground ball guy, you know, I mean, just, just yourself, um, you know, and, and the other part was, was being creative on how to get the ball to your spot. So working on, you know, whatever you want to call it, most people call it a hockey, right. Or a goose or a soccer, right. Um, you know, working on those things, um, you know, every day was important for our wing guys, right. So the way we worked on it, the Fogos had their warm up, right. Where I'm calling a whistle, but the wing school guys would have their own, their own personal warm up that Jed would kind of lead, right? And it would start. I don't know how I'm going to demo, I'm going to demonstrate this without a, a, a stick and a ball. But the first thing they would do to just get comfortable with the ball kind of down around their ankles and, and just get kind of creative touches was they would what we called crossovers, right? So they would bounce the ball kind of, you know, they would be, 
you know, if you can see like stick kind of down at their hip with the ball, they would bounce it and then catch it back in, right? And then they throw it that way and catch it this way, right? Yeah. So they're just kind of crossing the ball right-handed and left-handed and they would do 10. And it's funny, you know, it was something that we, um, you know, part of it was me giving them stuff, just stuff to do. So they weren't standing around waiting for the face-offs to finish their warm-up. But uh, again, it, it created, um, you know, just a level of, of comfort when handling the ball and picking it up in awkward situations, right? I think there is one that, that you know, Jed is really good off the ground and, and guys make this play a, a, a decent amount. Um, but it, it just made guys comfortable with, um, you know, handling the ball. The next one we would do uh, was hockey's, right? So we would basically, you know, for 10 yards, you'd scoop it, just throw it out in front of you, right? And then break on the ball, pick it up, scoop it, maybe make a little move. So yeah, that's something that, that you know, Jerry Byrne does well with his defense, defensemen all the time is they'll hockey all the way across the field, right? They'll just kind of yeah. throw it, pick it up, make a move. I'm sure, you know, you've seen that drill and, and sure. it's something we did just in a, a limited space with our guys to get used to throwing. And sometimes we'd, you, we'd do it with a partner, right? So you add the communication of, hey, hey, hockey left, hockey left. So they scoop, throw it left. That guy scoops it up, and the next guy's, hey, you know, hockey right, hockey forward, hockey forward, and, and add the communication. Then you do it in, in teams, and again, you have six guys up there with you. Now, you know, there's, there's a way to effectively use all those guys in, in a limited space. Um, the last one was, was contested GBs, and that's what we were going to kind of see here, was if you have, you know, it takes three guys, and you can kind of have a line, but basically you line up your, your two guys have their sticks like this, over top of the ball, right? So the ball's in the middle. They just put their sticks like this. They're not super heavy on their hands or anything. They're standing there. And then a third guy just runs through and runs through and scoops the ball, right? Again, just a little thing that they can do while the, the, the Fogos get their warm up, and it helped them get low and really accelerate through the ball. And even if they missed it, it was okay because they're getting the ball going in their direction, right? And that's why here I really think this was something that, that helped Jed, right? Ball sitting here. He's able to get low, right, get through the ball and escape this, this play, right, with the ball. And, again, we get transition, right, coming out the other end. We don't score on this either. He misses that one as well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a good was really good. He was a first-team All-American, but he, for some reason, he just did not score from, from, on the face box very often. You know, other drills. Th those were – that was their warm-up, right? Other drills we do with our face-off guys to be good at ground balls. Um, and our wing guys, one was, was life or death GBs, right? We would basically take two poles and line them up about three yards behind uh, the, the guy who's going to pick up the ground ball and then put a ground ball about three yards in front of him. So he should get the ball, but the poles, their job was to basically wreak havoc and throw, you know, they don't want to hurt their teammate, but I wanted them to throw junk and make sure this guy felt it as he picked up a ground ball and, and just, you know, scoop it up and, and escape, um, you know, from – you know, so, so we would line up, you know, let's say these guys are poles. We line up a pole, right, a pole. The face-off guy's like here. The ball's like here. And this guy now has to scoop this with those guys on him, escape, right, and then, you know, throw it to me as he escaped. He had to escape these guys, like, for a while. It wasn't like, oh, he could turn and just huck it at me. He had to really make sure he got away from them, you know, basically get it so he could put it right on my ear and get close to me with these guys just tracking him down, right? So, so you know, part toughness getting through the GB, part, you know, savvy and, and poise handling, you know, maniacs chasing you with, with a stick. <laughs> with big sticks. With, a big, with big sticks, exactly. Um, so, you know, that, that was a big one, especially because Jack struggled. He was so great on the faceoff, but he struggled early in his career at picking up the ball. He would, like, get there and kind of spaz out and overrun it, and then guys would get there. So we did that a couple times with him, and quickly he realized he didn't want to do that drill anymore, so he got better at picking up ground balls. Um, another one is, is chunk and chase. We would have faceoff guys. Um, you know, we would have lines of, of guys. We'd have maybe a faceoff guy here, right? Lines of guys out, two lines out here, um, you know, two lines out here, right, with a face-off guy. You know, these guys just clamp, pull it between their legs. These two guys are just sprinting, right, a one-on-one -on -one GB, um, you know, from here, right, to get the ball. 
you know, and they're just fighting for it. You know, what, what we talk about a lot is we want to win that first step and get in front of the guys. So we have control um, and, and make sure that then we can dictate. And then, yeah, we work on some communication with this too, right? Hey, send it deep, right? You know, pull it short because, because he's in front. Um, but a lot of this was just the toughness of, of fighting for a one-on-one -on -one ground ball when the ball sports out there. Right. And then the last one, um, you know, not the last one, but another one we did commonly was uh, called, you know, box out GBs. And we would just have this guy on the back of the faceoff guy, put a ball right, you know, there um, in front of them. And then, you know, first whistle, this guy's got to try to get around him to get the ball. And he's just staying there boxing out, keeping him on his back until the second whistle. And then we had a lot of times either have him scoop and, and, hockey it to space or kick it right with his foot, get it to space. And then he can run and, and escape. Um, you know, all he had to box out for a, a second or two and then he could hockey it or kick it. Yeah. So there's two whistles. So it may be up to like five, 10 seconds, right? Guys are just like, you know, reaching around, trying to throw wrap checks, get, get to the ball. Um, you know, first whistle they're on that second whistle They're the, the guy's able to really go for the ball. Reading the scrum. Um, you know, I think where I left it, I was talking about where we want our wings to line up. You know, what I was talking about here, we've got, um, you know, this is in practice, right? And these guys get too close, right? I think you heard me say I want guys about five yards away. These guys are at a great spot. The pole's doing an excellent job of keeping him on his hip. He doesn't want to be behind him, doesn't want to be in front of him. Stay here so that he can break on the ball any which way and, and be ready to, to make a play on it. These guys, however, the, the freshman here gets a little, you know, they kind of try to duke it out. And what I tell guys is, is if someone wants to get this close, then stay back here, right? I mean, at that point, you can let him be in front of you, right? We're okay with it because now we, we communicate, send it deep, right? This is where, hey, you know, send it deep right, deep right, or, or yourself. That's where you're still telling him where he can go for himself, or you can send it deep because he's got position, right? And so something Jed did a really good job of with Jack, if a guy would get a first step on him, he just concede it, stay back and tell them to send it deep. Um, on this one, right, you'll notice as they spin, they're so close, he ends up tripping his teammate. And yeah, our, our, you know, our, our backup faceoff guy goes belly down and, and Blue gets an easy, what should have been an easy first chance GB um, to, to win the faceoff, right? The next one here, um, you know, again, on practice, this is where I was saying the freshman went rogue, right? This is not something we talk about to come all the way back here because now he should be telling him where he can pull the ball and he's so far away that he can't be a part. Even if the ball got pulled to here, you know, this guy and Jack, the, the, the blue faceoff guy, would be able to get to this ball before he did, right? Or at least make it interesting. So we don't ever really want guys coming all the way back here unless we're just getting dominated. We're, we're getting, we're losing forward every time. Right, so here, blue does a really good job of balancing. Again, you see white, you know, our, our LSM gets too close, right? He's able to communicate that he's wide open, pulls it right to him. Now he misses the catch here, but, you know, that's the, the, this is why we work on it, right? I mean, the, the communication was great. I wonder if we can get audio on this. Right, so you can see, you can hear him saying, he's saying, you know, you know pull it left, pull it left. But he, he loses the clamp, right? We end up getting to pull the ball down, right? And, and get an, an easy, what should have been an easy face-off win, right? Now in a game, right, this again happens. We end up with two guys back here, right? He keeps good distance, right? Huber, Matt Huber, one of our senior captains, gets a little too close. He wasn't on the wing all that much. Um, you know, and, and because we don't balance, right, you know, he should have either been here or Garrett should have been here and, and we don't, you know, give up this face off that easy. Right. So now we go back, right. How we work on this stuff. A, a drill that we came up with, um, to use our wing guys was partly the, the, you know, have a face off guy down, you know, and this is partly, it, it works on a couple different things. One, it helps on wing guys reading the body language of face-off guys and competing for, for GBs. And, and it also works on, um, you know, the, the face-off guy basically getting hacked and, and letting guys cheat and, and do whatever the wing guy wants to try to disrupt the, the face-off guy and then, you know, scooping up a contested GB. Um, so what we would do if we go to the whiteboard, what we would do is we would have, you know, let's say this guy 
is a face-off guy. This check mark is a wing guy. He would be down. He would be on his feet here. And on the whistle, right, he would clamp the ball. And the, the check mark was allowed to do basically anything to him. He could, you know, pull his, um, you know, his, his forearm here, right? He could, um, you know, check down on him. He could hit him a little bit, right? Anything that, that you may had see in a game that just isn't going to get called that often, right? I mean, you know, refs, God bless them. They, they do the best they can, but they just don't see the face off very well, right? I think that's, it's a really tough thing to officiate. There's so many things to look for. It happens so fast. And there's so many, you know, to, to see the wings, right? To, to see exactly what they're doing with the heads of their stick and everything happens so quickly, it's hard to officiate. So a lot of times stuff gets missed. So what we decided to, to on our face-off guys was, hey, let's work on guys cheating. Let's work on guys doing illegal stuff so that when we see it, one, we know how to exit from it and we know how to win it, but also we're just you. It's not something we're going to complain about and, and let it be an excuse. We've worked on it, right? So, you know, he stands here and then the face-off guy is able to exit wherever he wants, right? You know, he can exit out here, right? You know, any which way, and then they're breaking on the ball. Right. And this guy gets to work on reading the language of how he's going to exit each way. Right. Whether he backs back, uh, you know, pivots and pulls it this way, whether he goes, you know, forward with it and, and he gets to stay on his hip reading what that looks like. Right. That's a, a really big piece of it. Right. Another part in, in reading and breaking on the ball. You know, we talked about the corkscrew with a wing communicating on his team. Now we did a corkscrew. And, and a wing guy's there, but he's not allowed to uh, communicate, right? He just is, is kind of there moving around. And the face-off guy pivots, you know, is, is spinning, spinning, and on the second whistle, just pulls the ball wherever he wants. And the wing guy has to break on it, right? Read that, break on it, you know, and explode through the, through the ground ball, right? And then the last part was, you know, working on the positioning of the, the wing guys, right, was doing the hand wars that we talked about, or even a corkscrew with a one-on-one -on -one GB, right, with, with two wing guys, right, so if we're, the, the Fogover's wing GB is the first drill we talked about, the corkscrew with no communication, right, uh, and then the hand wars, or even a corkscrew with one-on-one -on -one GB, now one guy's communicating, but one guy's not, and, and you know, corkscrew, corkscrew, you know, pull the ball out to the guy communicating with him and the other guy's fighting for the, for the ground ball and has to, you know, react and try to basically, you know, be better than the guy who's, who's communicating with him. Um, and then the last piece is really just be creative, right? Find different ways to use guys, you know, partly to use them and keep them incorporated in practice, partly to add things that you could possibly see in a game. I'm a big believer and I hate doing anything in a game that I haven't practiced, right? So whether it's seeing it in film of something that, hey, this is something I didn't know would happen or, or may not happen, uh, or, or I'm sorry, you know, just happened that we hadn't seen before. Well, let's go back and break it down and put it in a drill that now we can work on, right? And now we're ready for it, you know? So you try to think, you know, you're, when you're brainstorming with your coaching staff, you're thinking, what could possibly happen that we haven't seen, right? And this is for every facet of the game. I'm, you know, the microcosm of, of face-offs is, is what I kind of dealt with, but that's what you want to be able to say is, you know, anything that could happen, we've worked on. Whether, you know, it's a, a ground ball scrum and the ball exits one way, right? That's why we were able to, that clip of, of Jed, right? So this is, like I said, this is probably my, my favorite clip that I was able to find. All right. So what we worked on and part of reading the scrum and part of the, the film, right, is knowing what this guy was going to do if we didn't let him win it forward and, and if he won the clamp, Right. So we knew that if he won the clamp, one, Jack was going to try to shovel and get the ball moving. But the other part is if he didn't, he was going to back what, what you know, is called a backdoor exit, right? So he clamps, he pivots backwards, and he pulls it back to himself that way. And, and this guy especially, Billy Sasso, was fantastic at keeping the ball close to him, keeping the ball within it, between his shoulders, because he's a, a big, you know, kind of thick dude. If he did that, he was able to win the ball and then, you know, was, was agile and, and could escape, right? So we had kind of one window to get this ball if he was going to do it. And it was exactly what Jed does here, right? Coming off of this, Jed, you know, we talked about it, you know, before this face-off, like, hey, just, you know, go all out for this, right? Just, just sprint for this, knowing Jack's not going to let him forward. So here, he has the ball. We know he's won the clamp. Jack's not letting him pull the ball anywhere else right, or kind of encouraging him to, to go here. We've got a face-off guy or a, a LSM breaking to cover the break if he does somehow squirt the ball out this way. But watch Jed 
you know, I'll watch it, let it play in, in full motion. Watch where Jed ends up. And he basically steals it from him right, right in the middle as he pulls it out, right? As you go back here, right, go in slow motion. You know, Jed, he's pulling it, and Jed's waiting for him to, to pull the ball out for him, you know? And, and you know, again, part, part film work, part communication, pre, pre face off a lot you know, working in practice on the, the footwork of what guys are, look like, where they're going to pull the ball based on what their, their body language and what their mm -hmm. footwork is, right? As he starts to pivot, Jed got, goes from here straight there, knowing that's where he's going to pull the ball, and we get a crucial possession in a, in a totally new game here. It's awesome. Um, going back here, right, we went through these drills, right? What to do when losing, right? And I've kind of interwoven that, right? So, so you know, this will be kind of a quick slide. But the biggest thing is facing off is really easy when you win claps. You know, I mean, that just is, is part of what it is. That's why, you know, Yale is, is you know, was, was 70, 80% on the year, right? TD Herndon has got really fast hands. That's why we were 75% on the year because Jack Hodgson has really fast hands. You know, and, and we won clamps and we worked on all this other stuff to make sure that we weren't losing possessions that we should win because we're winning clamps. So, you know, the, the other part that we worked on with everybody else, right, we knew what Jack was going to do, but we worked on what to do if we're going to lose, right? And part of that is, you know, the face-off guy, right, whether it's going from your feet, um, we kind of went away from that this year, um, except for one guy, we, we converted an LSM who was a kid who was a, a awesome kid. Taylor Cashman was a, a captain at, at Gilman, um, walked onto our team and just wasn't going to find playing time anywhere, right? There, there was just guys in front of him, but he was a kid who worked really hard and wanted to, to you know, be a part of it, right? So, so we put him at the faceoff X. Partly this was to make, give us another option at the faceoff X, right? And partly it was to help Jack go against poles, right? You know, you see that a lot, um, you know, so – if, if you're winning clamps. So we put him up there and what his job was, again, don't let the guy go forward, right? And then our wings would lock off and make it, you know, we were just trying to make it a scrum, right? So that was a, a, a big piece of it. And then the other piece is all this other stuff, the reading the scrum, right? Working on ground balls so that if you do make it a scrum, right, you feel like you have an upper hand, right? So a great clip of, of Taylor Cashman, right? One right here in, in our first round tournament game, right? Cashman at the faceoff X, line up here. And, and the reason we would line up and we would tell this guy what he was to do was to break right this way, right? We wanted him to go straight to the back of this guy because we knew, again, if Cashman wasn't going to let him win it forward, his most logical exit was the, the drop step and, and, you know, backdoor or not backdoor was the, the defensive exit, right? So if you watch here, right, watch where both of these guys kind of go. Cashman gets a good tie up. He does exactly what we're talking about. And what Cashman worked on was one, the rake, right? Rake, and then beat on this guy's kind of bottom hand there, right? Try to work on the shovel a little bit, stay athletic, stay in front of him. So that this is where you could go. And, and he pulls it. Our wing guys know it and are going there. And Cashman's able to, to make a great play. And a guy that we, you know, added to wing school, Banks Flager, again, probably our fourth or fifth D midi, wasn't going to be on man down, ended up being a, a really valuable resource and found some playing time on the wing for us. Another one, and this is a, a, you know, part of it, and we'll talk in a sec about kind of making it a full field game, but, you know, the, the LSM, um, you know, we want to force the ball back, and then we want to ride, right? That was the, what we married. Kind of the other part that I had autonomy coaching was, was riding the ball, and, and we really focused on hustle, right? The, the communication and, and, you know, ball pressure from our attackmen. So this one, this is our first uh, game against York, right? We put Cashman in there to, to mix it up, right? And, and we almost have them, as you'll see, right? We're, we're what we call dragons. There's two poles. We've got a pole on the wing. We've got a short stick um, defense or short stick D midi uh, at attack right now. And Jed up on the wing here to, to make sure he can read the play, right? And Cashman does exactly what we want. He wins it. Their guy wins it goes backwards, we stay locked off on here, right? We, we beat him here, our attackmen are coming up, we get a great double, All right? We're communicating through this. Again, and, and with the new rules for, for college, the 20 seconds to get it over the midline, this now is, is a little more enticing, the ride, if you force the ball back, because they have to go all the way back to their goalie, 
you know, they're now, right, if we, if we want to count it, right, he's got possession at nine seconds. As we play through this, you know, now they're back, they're, you know, 40 yards from the midfield line, and they're, they're 10 seconds, they're halfway through their clear right now, basically, right? And again, we jump up here, the one mistake we make is, is Jed is a little too far upfield, right? It isn't, isn't, there's no one behind him communicating where to go. And they're able to get this pass over, or, you know, over top of us. But if he was dropped, there's no extra guy here, right? If we were here, you know, they're at, you know, 13 seconds, you know, they're going to have to reverse the ball again. And I think we, we've got a really good chance. And again, these are all ways that you have to find, you know, you have to practice and you've got to just really find ways to win a possession when you're not winning face-offs because it's really, really hard. But this is something we worked on, right? Was, was riding was a part of it, using a, a different face-off guide that was going to lose, but was going to lose in the way that we knew we were going to lose instead of, you know, Jack Hodgson is, is going to win more than, than Taylor Cashman is. But when he loses, it's slightly more unpredictable, even though we've tried to work on all those unpredictable scenarios, right? So here again, this was, was, you know, it stinks that they, they cleared it, but we were really impressed and, and you know, excited about the, the opportunity of using Cashman. This was his first year ever facing off, right? And, and he was able to do this, put good pressure, not overextend, and, and we won some possessions back that way, right? If we go all the way back to our, um, our thing here, right? The goals for wings, you know, for part of it, one of the goals was forcing turnovers even on faceoff losses, right? And part of our goals for as a faceoff unit was was to get ride backs, right? What we called ride backs, right? Even if we lose, try to get one ride back a game. You know, I mean, hopefully you're winning more faceoffs than you're losing, you know, in terms of clamps and just winning the outright ground ball. But if we were losing, we want to try to get one ride back a game, right? That's one extra possession, and and we knew we were a good offensive team, right? And and you know, we're if we win, if in general, if you win the possession battle, you're going to win most lacrosse games, right? Unless you're severely outmatched. Um, you know, so so how we approached it, and again, this is part stuff that I've I've addressed, right? You know, I talked about traditionally how we start, even after all the film work and prep work, we got to see how fast Jack's hands are. If this guy is a lot faster than we could realize on film, right? Maybe you know he just has Jack's number. That's part of you hear faceoff guys talk about, you know, the faceoff being kind of a, a chess match and tic tac or, or rock paper scissors, right? Some some guys just are able to beat other guys, even though they lose to, to a different common opponent, um, you know, so we have a lot of film and, and scout that was, was a big part of it and, and would share, have a whole, you know, huddle playlist of, of what the faceoff guy was going to do, what their wings were going to do, were they going to lock off, were they going to try to be aggressive, um, you know, where they were going from there, and then how good was their faceoff guy handling the ball, because if he wasn't very good, we'd throw Cashman out there a little more, like, hey, we're going to lose the clamp, but we're going to win some possessions back. We want to save Jack. This is his third year in a row now, I think, of taking almost 400 face-offs, um, if not more. So that's just a, a, you know, it's a dangerous thing for a face-off guy. It's a lot of reps at something that's really hard on your body. This is also why we used Cashman a little bit. Um, you know, I talked about, you know, early what Jed does, right? We, we would, you know, Jed would dictate in the poll, his job was to be defensive, right? It was to mirror Jed and then also be defensive, make sure that we're not giving anything up. Jed's able to go in there and kind of, if we know we have a guy playing defense, we can, um, you know, Jed, Jed can be really aggressive in trying to make a play and go get the ball. And usually he's, he's able to read whether Jack's winning or Jack's shoveling and, and getting the ball moving. And we're able to come up with that. You know, I talked about this. This is something, right, that we worked on. We lose the clamp right there. Guy actually does go forward, but Jack's able to get it. Um, you know, oh, this was the one I was looking for. But you see the way Jed picks this up, right? This is a part of us just working on picking up ground or being comfortable with our stick and, and you know, picking up ground balls in, in different ways, right? We can test it. He's able to pick, up, pick this up on the run, kind of handcuffed himself, right, but explodes through it and, and is able to, to spark some transition for us. Misses that one, too. You know, another one here, right? Uh, we watched that one, right? Jed comes in, you know, from the middle there, is, is able to make that play. Um, you know, we, on film, we saw on this one, right? We actually lined Jed up on the opposite side of draw side, 
um, for most of the game because we knew their guy was going to protect the break. Their biggest, their most important piece was this guy was going to, to protect the break, right? So we just put Jed over here. Instead of a pole where he can still get jumped, right, they were dragons. They had two poles all game. This is against Gettysburg, a game that we lost 14-13, I believe. Um, you know, but we put Jed here, lined him up a little bit deep, but not so deep that, that he couldn't, you know, if we were to lose, he couldn't be in the scrum, right? And then Jack's able to win, right, backwards pivot and pull it to, to our guy, right? And we watched that one earlier, but now we're talking about something else. Right, see, they do a great job balancing here, right, as they're spinning. Again, their guy is, our pull is defensive here. Their guy got really close to the scrum, so we don't want to, to be too close, um, you know, and, and he stays on his back and is now able to communicate, hey, we could send it deep, but is also defensive and letting Jed, you know, be able to make a play, which he, he does here, right? He's able to scoop this ball up, you know, and, and one thing to, to go off topic a little bit, you know, with wing guys is work on picking the ball up one hand because there's a time to do it. I think the, the you know, old school coach is always two hands on ground balls. Well, there's times where if you're good at it and you practice it, right, which we do, scooping up a one-handed ground ball is necessary. Now, there's also times that you want to pick it up two hands, and this is something I discussed with Jed a lot because he went too much to, to, went to the well a couple too many times with one-handed ground balls. But on this one, right, you'll see he's able to kind of shield his guy, right, scoop this up and, and you know, stay moving and, and, you know, then backhand the ball back to, to, a, um, to a teammate, right? So make sure that you're, you know, working on this, you know, and, and you know, the one-handed ground ball is, is perfectly acceptable as long as you work on it. Again, don't do something in a game that you haven't done before in, in practice, right? And if something comes up, because stuff always comes up, find a way to build it into practice and build it into that 10 to 15 minutes you have, right? Um, I think there's another one. Using a one-hand GB as a face-off guy just while we're on this topic, right? Jack Hodgson is, is you know, winning clamps, um, you know, but their face-off guy was athletic and was able to com contest, right? So here, here comes a guy. We worked on this a lot, especially in that life-or-death GB drill, is a little bit choked up, right? And then using the other hand, can, can you guys see me, right? So use this hand, right? You're scooping it up with this hand and you're shielding, right? Just putting this up. It's not a ward as long as you don't swat at it, right? So you're, you know, able to pick this up and he's able to escape, now make a big turn and get out. And he actually makes an unbelievable play going up against the sideline, puts this on the guy's ear, breaking up field. Um, you know, so all, um, you know, stuff that you can work on, just, just, you know, be open to working on stuff that maybe was unconventional or, or really taboo, you know, in the past. We were here, all right, so having a plan for, for all situations, right? So I talked a little bit about, right, what we called slims was two short sticks, right? Sometimes we would go dragons if we were losing, right? And we, we you know, maybe Jack was tired, right? We showed the clip of us going dragons. And then that allows us to go two poles in the ride, right? Instead of one, we've got a, a short stick down guarding an attackman and two poles are now in the middle of the field kind of wreaking havoc, right? And then the other part is make sure that, that you practice every sort of game scenario you could see, right? So riding from a faceoff, we talked about that, right? Reading where the opponent will pull the ball, right? We talked about that. Um, giving up a fast break, you know, you can't always predict it. And it's something that I didn't work on enough. I got spoiled because we had Jack. And actually in that York game, we gave up, I think we gave up three uh, faceoff goals, right? One was a traditional just – or two were just a traditional face-off guy came down, he scored one, and, and then, you know, passed it to the point guy and scored on another one. Another one was kind of a, a broken play situation that got them a goal. But in a tournament game where we lose by three, right, that's something I, I've been kicking myself for, for months now because, you know, that's something we can't do. We had it as a goal. It's something that I don't think I did a good enough job practicing for – um, in practice because it just wasn't a scenario that came up. But make sure you're practicing giving up a fast break and getting a fast break, right? You saw a couple of those clips. We get some goals. We get some good shots. You know, there's plenty of other clips of us not doing it so well, right? So make sure that you are practicing all that stuff, even if it seems, you know, simple and, and you know, they should know how to do it. Get the physical reps of, of how to do that, right? 
clearing, you know, we talked about riding. So we also want to work on clearing when we win the ball back, right? When we go defensive, how do we clear the ball from there, right? We've got 20 seconds, plenty of time, but we've got to be organized in what we want to do. And then a man up, man down face off. But, you know, I kind of skipped over it. This, the end of game, uh, end of quarter situation is something that in this Gettysburg game, right? This is why this came up because we hadn't really worked on it from a face off. We had done a lot of end of game scenarios in a lot of different ways, but for some reason we missed on doing it from a face off. And it, Gettysburg scored with 17 seconds left um, to go up one. And, you know, obviously you're, you're disappointed, but I realized in that moment we didn't have a really good plan of what to do from there, right? 17 seconds is a ton of time. And as you've seen in clips, we're winning clamps. We're winning plenty of face-offs. We should have a good shot. It doesn't mean we're definitely going to score, but there should be a plan of action for how to handle that situation. And it gives guys confidence, right? When they feel prepared, when they feel like you've prepared them for everything, and this goes for all facets of the game, right, and why we did so many end-of-game, end-of-quarter situations, they feel comfortable everywhere, right? And we, we lost – I want to say three or four one goal games early in the year. And we just kept doing end of game scenarios end of quarter scenarios, any sort of, you know, kind of quirky game scenario that we could think of. A lot of it was, Hey, day after a game, what did we see that we hadn't seen before? Let's just rep that out. Let's talk about how we want to handle that next time. Right. So in the face off, you know, we obviously, we lose to Gettysburg. We don't really have a plan the next week we go back and we have a plan, right? If we're winning clamps, right. We, our plan was to, Right. And this happened again, you know, lucky for us, we got this chance, right? As you see nine, nine, there's about 14 or 15 seconds left, right? Lynchburg has just scored. But the other part is that we were prepared after they scored. Nobody really was hanging their heads. No one was, ah, you know, we're, we're done. Everyone knew Jack, Jed, Drew Barnard knew how we were going to handle this. Right. And we knew we would have a chance because we were winning clamps. Right. And the other part is, I don't believe Lynchburg did, right? They actually used a timeout because they, they knew that we had a plan and they come out and they do something they hadn't done all, all game, which was this guy go from his feet, which isn't a bad play, but it's something they haven't done all day. I, I don't know how much they've, they've worked on, right? So our end of game plan when we're winning clamps is pull Jed back, see what this guy does. Pull him back, he's protecting the break, right? That, this guy's out of the play. This is about Jed and Jack. If their LSM goes with Jed, then we know Jack can go forward and he's to pull the ball out right away. AJ, our lefty first team All-American attackman is popping out. We're getting it to him and he's going, right? We're just going to the rack. There's not enough time to really have a, a strategic play. We just want to be able to react. And we've worked on this out of, um, you know, in, in practice. If he's not, if he's down here protecting this, Jack's to win it and pull it straight to Jed. And Jed's either, depending on the time, either attacking or rifling the ball to AJ and AJ's gone, right? And, and that was our plan. It was simple. Right. And it's not, you know, I mean, it's, you know, I don't care telling other people because it, it's, you know, dependent on if we win a clamp, if we're losing clamps, right. If, if, you know, if that's a, a part of this, right. If, if we're losing clamps, then we're putting both guys back and saying, Jack, you can try to win, but we're, we're going to stay defensive on this, right. We're not going to give up transition. We don't know what's going to happen if you're not winning clamps, right. We're going to make sure that, that they, you know, are winning the ball backwards or, or at least not, you know, getting a fast break and, and, you know, you go to overtime with them. Right. So on this one here, right, we get exactly what we want. This guy stays here. We tell Jed, you know, keep him back. I would have liked him a little farther. Right. But Jack goes forward because this guy was doing something he wasn't really ready for. You know, I mean, it doesn't look as pretty as you would think, but we come up with this AJ pops. Right. We get to here and we get our, our best player attacking the goal. Right. With, with minimal seconds left, we get this back up looking at it now questionable but we get the call he gets you know our freshman attackman attacks and we get two shots so so because of this because we had a plan because everyone felt prepared and was ready for this we get two really good shots in the last 15 seconds of a game that we end up going on to win in overtime right so having that plan and having really and even if you suck at it every time you do it in practice you probably will once it comes up in a game they don't think about oh man we were terrible at that they think oh we've done that before Right? We, know what to, we know what to expect. We've been in that feeling. You know, if you have a scoreboard, um, you know, or you have access to use your scoreboard during practice, put that up, keep score, put time up there so that, that, that it feels as real as possible. Right? Get guys on their bench, get coaches there, and run it, you know, the situation as much as you can, just like a game. 
you know, and like I said, you know, practicing all of these is, is really important. Um, you know, I think that's, that's really all I got. Um, I'm sure there's other stuff I missed. Awesome stuff. Um, if you guys have questions uh, or anything, please let me know. Um, the biggest part is, is use your time, be creative, right? Um, you know, like I said, you have to find ways to, to win the possession battle, even if you're going to lose faceoffs, or if you're winning faceoffs, make sure that you get every one of those possessions, not just winning clamps and then, you know, surviving to, to get possession or even losing ground balls because someone's prepared better than you, right? You, as a coach, you got to control what you can control and that's preparing guys as, as best you can, right? And the other part is, you know, being better as a face-off unit. If you have an okay face-off guy, that's, that's what it is, right? Um, so, you know, the, the create a culture, right? Create something guys want to be a part of and, and find ways to, to affect the outcome of, of the game, even when you're not winning claims, right? So thank you guys. This is awesome. Jamie, I'm Thanks. sorry we had technical difficulties. No problem, I really man. appreciate you letting me do this. I really enjoyed coaching face-offs, um, you know, and, and, you know, hopefully this, this turned out well and whoever's watching this got something out of this because, you know, I love coaching it. I love doing this. Um, you know, feel free to reach out if you need anything. Thanks, Jamie. Awesome, man. Thanks. Good night, Will. Thanks, everybody.